Okay, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this um, fifth presentation in the Sutra study series. This one is entitled The Siddhis, that is the Mystic Powers from Meditation, Part One. So um, before I jump in, I just wanted to give a, um, a landscape uh, per, of how the Yoga Sutras are arranged. So Patanjali, in 195 or 196, sutras um, there's often a debate as to whether there's one sutra that was added by later by somebody and not from patanjali but usually it's 195 or 196 sutras these are terse aphorisms so they are arranged into four different chapters um, so the first chapter is called the samadhi pada there patanjali introduces the concept of yoga um, what yoga is and he gives a general description of the yoga practice. And this is what we saw in the first presentation. That uh, in the first presentation that was titled um, The Yoga Practice as defined by Patanjali, um, we saw that. And then in the um, second, hello Mayuko. Hi. In the second, presentation, we um, saw what is called um, the, the foundation of yoga practice as defined by Patanjali. So in the first chapter, what Patanjali does is he just introduces yoga, and then he goes all the way into very advanced stages of meditation, because the culmination of yoga is something called samadhi, a very deep meditative state. And Patanjali goes into various aspects of and different forms of samadhi. Um, so it, it's as though some people argue, why did Patanjali introduce something that is so complex right in the first chapter? Why did he not build it? But this was for advanced partis, uh, advanced practitioners of yoga. So he introduces the, um, this is called the samadhi yoga or raja yoga. He introduces it right away. So those people they all they need to do is just read the first chapter of the yoga sutras the second chapter is for lay people it's considered the most important chapter for lay people like us so um, as i said the first portion of the second chapter is the foundation for what patanjali calls the ashtanga yoga the eight limbs of yoga so this is what we saw in the second presentation in this yoga sutra study series then in the second chapter the next portion Patanjali devotes to the eight limbs of yoga, the Ashtanga yoga, or he calls it Ashtavangani. And this is what we saw in the third and the fourth presentations. And the third chapter is a chapter on meditation initially. Patanjali describes the last few limbs of the Ashtanga yoga, which is on meditation. And then he goes into um, the benefits of meditation and finally um, uh, on the siddhis, which are the mystic superpowers from meditation. And the last chapter is the Kaivalya Pada, that is on the ultimate liberation. So this is how he is arranged. So now in this fifth uh, presentation, we will see the mystic powers from meditation and also the benefits of meditation as enunciated by Patanjali. So I would like to acknowledge Dr. Jayashree's pristine chanting, which I have liberally sprinkled all over the presentation. So these are the contents and let's dive in. So first, let me recap the different stages in meditation because this um, chapter is all about meditation and its powers. So Patanjali defines three stages in meditation. The first stage is called dharana. So Patanjali the uses the sutra, Desha Bandha Chittasya Dharana. What it means is that it's focusing of the mind onto one place. Desha is place. Bandha, you know Bandha is bind or lock. We use Bandhas and Asanas. Desha Bandha Chittasya. Chitta is mind. Desha Bandha Chittasya Dharana. So Dharana is the fixing of the mind to one place. Um, so desha, the desh, is, you would have heard the word everywhere. Bangladesh, it's a country. It means the land of the Banglas, so the, the place of the Banglas or the Bengalis. So that's what it means. 
then comes dhyana so the first dharana requires some effort because your mind tends to wander you bring it back it wanders you bring it back in dhyana it becomes becomes a little more easy when the contents of the mind remain the same from one moment to the next effortlessly it is called dhyana so the way patanjali defines it is tatra pratyaya ekatanatha dhyanam so pratyaya this word he would use again and again and again it means the, the it's like a theater screen of the mind because constantly in our mind there's a screen where we are playing images there are sounds right so that is the whole thing is called pratyaya and the pratyaya ekatanatha means same from one instant to another then it is dhyana so it's a little more effortless state the final state is the most important state it is called samadhi um so he defines it as a total absorption in the self and there is no object of focus in the mind um so he patanjali the way he says is um tat eva artha matra nirbhasam swarupa shunyam eva samadhi so um there is swarupa there's rupa which is form there is no form swarupa shunya means devoid of any form and it's just total absorption in the self so the best example that i can give is um, my meditation teacher would give this example so you're in a um, jacuzzi or like in a very uh, nice warm water you go sit in you feel just your, your body melting you're just totally absorbed your mind is so calm you feel so nice at least for a few minutes then your mind starts wandering but that that is the um um feeling people get in samadhi it's it's very um, there's no object in the mind you're just totally you feel like you're melting inside that's how it feels then patanjali says all these three stages they're sequential um tasya bhumishu vinyoga it's uh, these are practiced sequentially and patanjali says trayam eka samyama so all these three together are called samyama and when you practice samyama on different objects you get superpowers patanjali the way he says it is tat jayat pragnya alokaha when you master this uh, samyama you get pragnya is transcendental knowledge it's not common knowledge he says it's transcendental knowledge and that is what all the, the this uh, entire chapter is about all these superpowers incidentally about 20% of the uh, yoga sutras it's devoted to all these superpowers and we'll see what patanjali talks about them okay so now let's um, go and see what siddhis are so siddhis a siddhi is a superpower that comes as a byproduct with a mastery of a skill or a discipline so that is a siddhi and the there are people called the siddhas these are the accomplished ones so long ago in india there was a sage called agastya um in the, the indian mythology says that he was a mind born son of brahma and there were the sapta rishi sapta means seven so there are seven rishis which were created from the mind of brahma so agastya is one of the most famous of them and he contributed a lot um to literature and also to medicine so the siddha form of medicine it is even practiced in india today just like ayurvedic forms this is practiced they in addition to a lot of herbs they also use metallic ingredients for curing diseases and there was another great uh, a siddha a very accomplished person who was a contemporary of patanjali and he wrote one of the greatest yogic texts it's called tirumantiram he wrote it in tamil um, tamil is considered the oldest written language in the world next is sanskrit so um, in this he talks about all samadhi different aspects of yoga okay now we will get into um, the powers from various limbs of yoga so patanjali in the second chapter he talks about different limbs of yoga for every one of those limbs patanjali gives a great power 
that comes by perfecting any of the limbs of the yoga. For example, there is tapas. Tapas is austerity. And there is swadhyaya, which is study of the scriptures. And um, the third one is Ishwara Pranidhana. This one is um, the um, surrender to the uh, divine. OK, now let us um, see the powers from the various yamas. The yamas are the, the first limb of yoga. So yama and niyama. So we'll start with uh, the first one, ahimsa. Ahimsa pratishthayam tatsanidhau vairatyagata. So were you able to um, hear Jayashree's chant? Yeah? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah. So ahimsa is non-harming. Um, what Patanjali says is that it's a very beautiful sutra. It's quoted very often. Um, when ahimsa is established, ahimsa pratishtayam, when it's established, tat sannitav vairatyagaha, in the presence of somebody who is established in ahimsa, other beings, be it animals or people, lose their violent tendencies. The next one is called satya. Satya pratishtayam kriya phalashrayatvam when someone is established in truthfulness, his words will always bear fruit. This is what Patanjali says. The third is asteya, which is non-stealing or not taking more than what one needs. Asteya pratishthayam sarvaratnopasthanam So when somebody is established in just and non-stealing or not taking more than what one needs, all the riches come to that person. And the fourth one is Brahmacharya. It literally means walking in the path of Brahman. Um, it also means restraint uh, and celibacy. Brahmacharya pratishthayam viryalabhaha so one gains vigor by practicing brahmacharya. And the final one is aparigraha, which is non-coveting. So this is very beautiful. When somebody doesn't covet and lets go, um, the Buddha talks about it extensively. The knowledge of how one's life came to be will be very obvious. The Buddha's, um, we talked about it in the um, uh, third um, presentation. In the night of his enlightenment, the Buddha could recount tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of his lives because he let go. So non-coveting gives knowledge of how one's life came to be, all the, the your previous lives. This is what Patanjali says. Then comes Shaucha. Patanjali talks about powers from cleanliness, both internal and external. So. Sattva shuddhi saumanas yaika griyendriya jayatma darshana yogyatva nicha. Sattva shuddhi, here sattva refers to the mind, shuddhi is purification, purification of the mind, cheerfulness, one-pointedness, and complete control over the senses by maintaining cleanliness. This is what Patanjali says. Then comes santosha, which is the second niyama. Santoshat anuttama sukhalabhaha. So when you are content with what you have, and supreme joy comes. The third is tapas. We are all very familiar with tapas. When you do asana practice, it's considered a, a form of tapas too. You get great siddhis of the body and the senses, great powers. Um, your senses become so finely tuned. Your body gets great strengths by 
purifying the body with tapas. Tapas literally means heat. You're just with the heat, you're burning away the impurities. Then Swadhyaya, study of the scriptures. Swadhyaya Dishta Devata Samprayogaha. So the important thing is here, it says Ishta Devata, the deity of choice. This study of scriptures establishes communion with one's deity of choice. This is how Patanjali puts it. Final is Ishvara Pranidana. Patanjali doesn't talk about God. He just talks about this higher entity called Ishvara. Samadhi Siddhir Ishvara Pranidhana. He, so interestingly, he says the perfection of samadhis, and you get all the resultant siddhis by surrender to Ishvara. So he puts this in very high regard out there. And then there's the other limbs, so there's power associated with every limb of yoga. So asana. Tato dvandvana bhighataha. So this probably is very obvious. You, People who are very restless, uh, that's why the teens, young kids, when you make them do asanas, they settle down. So all the conflicts and the dualities in the mind, everything goes down. People achieve a level of peace. And this you can see in Ashtanga Yoga too. People, um, a lot of people, they had difficulties, um, a lot of internal conflicts. So once they start doing this, they're much more at peace with themselves than pranayama. So actually Patanjali talks, uh, there's two advantages of doing pranayama. One is it destroys the wheel covering the light within. It's a very powerful statement, shiyate, just sh destroys, Patanjali uses the word destroys. This this kind of um, um, this uh, covering it's it's dirt and covering of the light within. So you you become like effulgent. That's why they say when people who do a lot of pranayama and have perfected this, they radiate. This their skin glows. This is, um, is what generally taught, and it makes the mind perfect for fit for meditation. Then the the transition limb from outside to external to internal practices is called pratyahara, withdrawal of the senses. So when you withdraw the senses from external objects and go inward, you have complete mastery over the senses. So these are the great powers by perfecting any of the limbs of yoga. Now, Patanjali, um, he says these are great powers, but there are extraordinary powers, more than just great powers from meditation by dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. There's focus, then um, continuous fo um, focus with the same, mind's contents remaining the same, then samadhi is total absorption in the self. Patanjali then, um, talks about how to attain the Siddhis. So this actually comes in the fourth chapter. Um, he describes five ways in which to attain Siddhis. But I thought I'll put it here just for context. This is a very beautiful sutra, first sutra in the fourth chapter. Janmaushadhi mantra tapah samadhi ja siddhayaha so it, the siddhis are broadly speaking obtained in five ways so not just by samadhi but by birth some people by birth they have the siddhis and we'll see it's a very interesting topic how it comes then by medicinal herbs aushadi so janma's birth aushadi is medicinal herbs mantra is repeated chanting of a syllable or a verse or by tapas by austerity or by samadhi, the ultimate state of meditation. So siddhis by birth is a very interesting topic. Um, some people 
by birth. By birth means what? From karmas, from previous birth, they have a body that is suitable for attaining samadhi and hence the cities. Bhava pratyayo videha prakriti layanam. So Patanjali says that by nature, some people have a different um, a body that's very suited just by birth for attaining samadhi and gaining these cities. This topic is actually touched about in great detail in the Bhagavad Gita. So I wrote an article on this. Um, you can read it up if you would like. Once a yogi, always a yogi. In Bhagavad Gita, um, Arjuna asks this question to Krishna. What about people? So sometimes you start on the path of yoga, meditation, and then you fall off. Maybe there are distractions. You have life problems, everything. So what happens to those people? So you invested so much time, but then you fall off the path of yoga because of illness or anything. And um, Arjuna asks Krishna, so don't those people lose both um, are a failure in both the spiritual and in the worldly realms? So they've lost both. Krishna says, absolutely not. And he says, Tatratam buddhi samyogam labate paurvadehikam. Previous, from previous bodies, the yogi comes in touch with knowledge obtained in the previous bodies. Yatato chatato boyaha samsuddayo kurunandaraha. And what he does when he comes uh, into contact with that knowledge, he strives more than before for perfection. So nothing is lost. Um, he very clearly says, here. There's no counter effects, there's no loss. Even of this will save you from great fear. Um, Krishna says that. So, by virtue of the past practice, the yogi is again attracted to yoga. Even one who merely wants to know about yoga goes beyond Brahman. And he says, the yogi who strives with the right effort with siddhis obtained through many births, he attains the highest goal. So this is the birth of yogis. And then siddhis can be attained by other means too, um, medicinal herbs, by chanting mantras. So the medicinal herbs, Patanjali, Patanjali neither are the commentators, they don't talk about what it is. They just describe soma or something. Some people interpret it as um, uh, things like um, marijuana, but in the scriptural terms, this is not accepted. Um, then there's mantras, definitely by chanting mantras, you can get siddhis, and by tapas, austerity. Here you see people standing on, the, on their head and in various poses. Um, austerity is used to generate heat to purify the body. But the best form of Siddhi, Patanjali says, is from Samadhi. So when you meditate, the Siddhis born out of meditation are the best. The reason Patanjali says is that they do not leave karmic impressions. So what happens during meditation? So. Okay, so Patanjali explains the mechanics of meditation in the next few sutras in the third chapter. Uh, Patanjali says the natural tendency of the mind is to wander. So Vyuttana Nirodha Samskarayo. So um, this is how he explains it. There's a tug of war in the mind going on between the two samskaras. So before that, I have to define what samskaras are. They are the imprints on the mind. So if you want to know more, you can uh, read this link. Whenever we do an action um, or a, you, a thought, there's an imprint on the mind. So when you meditate, there is also an imprint on the mind. And this is what Patanjali calls the restraining samskaras. Nirodha samskara, restraining samskara, 
and the vithana samskara. So when we kind of crave for certain objects in the world, there is the outgoing samskaras, there's the vithana samskaras. And when you meditate, there's a restraining samskara. So there's a tug of war going on between the two. And every time you meditate, you're strengthening the restraining samskaras. And in meditation, you're kind of building up that. And to, at the samadhi, you have a complete um, overcoming of the outgoing samskaras with the restraining samskaras. This is what happens in meditation, according to Patanjali. So what happens when the restraining samskaras are strong? Tasya prashanta vahita samskara. So this is a very beautiful sutra. This again comes in the fourth chapter, but I introduced here because the context is correct in how I am uh, progressing through this. The more you meditate, the more you strengthen the restraining samskaras. And from this, Patanjali says, Prashanta Vahita, the Vahita's flow, Prashanta is peaceful, it's a continuous flow of peace brought about by these restraining samskaras. Then Patanjali goes on to say um, what, how Samadhi is attained, attainment of Samadhi. Okay, the way to read this is Sarvartha Kshayaha, which means Sarvartha means uh, Artha's objects, Sarvartha means all objects, and your mind is focused on all objects, that is all pointedness, it's scattered. Then ekagrata means one pointed. So when the mind um, from being all pointed, which is scattered, to getting to be one pointed, then you naturally get into a state of samadhi. So Patanjali says, Sarvartha Kshayo, all pointedness is destroyed. Ekagrata Udayo, one pointedness naturally arises. That is called the transformation. Chittasya Samadhi Parinamaha, the transformation of the mind into Samadhi. This is how Patanjali describes the attainment of Samadhi in meditation. So he adds one more sutra for this. Tatah punashanto ditau tulya pratyayau chittasya ikagrata parinamaha. Okay, so Shantaha, what has passed, Udita, what is arising, then when the um, Tulya Pratyaya, Tulya is equal uh, in the Pratyaya, so when um, the contents of the mind is same before and now, then it is called Chittasya Ekagrata Parinamaha, this um, is called Ekagrata. The important thing here is there is activity in meditation. So meditation is not a passive thing. He Patanjali says this very clearly to show that um, there is activity going on in meditation. It's just that the previous screen, um, the content of the mind is same as the present content of the mind. Okay, so we've seen um, some of the mechanics of meditation. Patanjali also um, says that he gives a lot of options to meditate. Um, and we'll see at the end of this, he says, if these don't work, find anything else that will kind of bring your mind to settle. Everything is valid. That's what Patanjali says. You can check out this article for some of the details of these sutras. Um, this actually Patanjali presents in the first chapter because he knows that it's very difficult to kind of settle the mind. So he gives all these options. And he repeatedly throughout the Yoga Sutras stresses the importance of a focused mind, because it's only with the focused mind you can get all these uh, powers. And finally, liberation. 
ಮೈತ್ರೀ ಕರುಣಾ ಮುದಿತೋಪೇಕ್ಷಾ ಸುಖ ದುಃಖ ಪುಣ್ಯ ಪುಣ್ಯ ವಿಷಯ So Patanjali knew that people are the biggest triggers in our lives. So they can unsettle your mind very easily. So meditating with attitude towards the people, this is the first of his um, different ways to meditate. So this is actually considered a very beautiful sutra and people um, all over the world, they meditate. Um, they read the sutra they and they chanted my three that is friendliness towards the sukha who are people who are happy karuna which is compassion towards the people who are angry and or who are suffering um dukkha these people who have a lot of suffering it's because of that they become angry they do things which are not good and then mudita delight towards the punya the virtuous people and upeksha indifference towards the apunya the unvirtuous so um people who are doing criminal acts um the attitude we should have towards them is upeksha indifference um because if you become angry towards them it will disturb your state of samadhi so um the best attitude to have is indifference patanjali says so one attains undisturbed calmness of the mind chitta prasadanam by cultivating bhavana of these attributes then the second way to meditate which we all know is with a breath ಪ್ರಚರ್ದನ ವಿಧಾರಣಸ್ಯ ವಿ ಆಲ್ ನೋ ದಟ್ ವೆನ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಅ ಡೀಪ್ ಎಕ್ಸಲೇಷನ್ ಯುವರ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಇನ್ವೋಕ್ಸ್ ದ ಪ್ಯಾರಾ ಸಿಂಪಥೆಟಿಕ್ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ವೆರಿ ರಿಲ್ಯಾಕ್ಸಿಂಗ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ರೆಸ್ಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಡೈಜಸ್ಟ್ ಆಸ್ ವರ್ಸಸ್ ಫ್ಲೈಟ್ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ಸೊ ಅ ಲಾಂಗ್ ಎಕ್ಸಲೇಷನ್ ದೆನ್ ಅಟ್ ದ ಎಂಡ್ ಎ ರಿಟೆನ್ಶನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಬ್ರೆತ್ will put you in a very calm state suitable for meditation the third one is on subtle sense perceptions vishayavati va pravritti rutpanna manasa sthiti nibandhini so patanjali says by um the focus on the subtle points of the body that resemble sense objects and aptitude arises that causes the mind to be steady so this is a very common form of meditation so if, uh, for those who have done vipassana what they do is they ask you to focus on body sensation um typically for many people it happens in the chest um you when you meditate with a feeling you will see some like nice when you breathe especially you'll have like a nice feeling in the chest and you'll feel like uh, it's your body is melting it's a it's a good feeling so you f- focus on this more and more and your entire system settles down um the commentators there they have different interpretation on this They're focusing on the subtle points like the tip of the nose the tip of the tongue um when you focus on the tip of a tongue it could evoke certain tastes and the tip of the nose certain smells and then your mind settles down these are smells that you like um people often in meditation they could start feeling certain smells that they like and what it does is it reinforces you it just settles your mind the familiar smell or the taste and it be- makes the mind very steady so this is one way to meditate then meditation on the light within so some people they close their eyes they see a, a light within and they are, are able to meditate on this so people are all different patanjali knows that so what one works for one may not work for the other that's why he gives options and he says if none of these work finally we'll see that he do whatever you can to settle your mind then meditation on the hankering free state just you're completely let go things you're not hankering for anything 
and you meditate on that state. Vitaraga Vishayam Vachittam So Raga is craving. So just a mind that is free of craving and hankering to sense objects. When you um, get to that state, you automatically fall into meditation. So try to um, evoke a state where you just you're letting go. That is what Patanjali says. And this is also a very interesting form of meditation using dreams. Using the knowledge gained from dreams in deep sleep as a support. Um, there is um, a form of um, uh, meditation with lucid dreaming. So in lucid dreams, you remember distinctly what's going on because that comes directly very it's coming from a state very close to your purusha the deep self so it has a lot to offer in terms of the deepest desires of your soul and the meditation on the knowledge that comes from your dreams it has a natural way to settle you down and take you very deep okay this is a very beautiful sutra so whatever works to get you into a meditative state, use that. That is valid, Patanjali says. Whatever means possible. Okay, so now we saw all about meditation, um, the mechanics of meditation. Right? We start, started with the three different stages of meditation. Dharana, initially it requires some focus, effort. Dhyana, it becomes much more easy. And Samadhi, you're totally absorbed in yourself. And by um, doing this on various objects, Patanjali says you get great Siddhis. And Patanjali then lays the foundation. He um, tries to explain how these Siddhis, they're not like some arbitrary powers defying the laws of science, but there is a method to that. So these Siddhis, like invisibility, is going to talk about invisibility. This could lo look like grandiose and just a, like a fanciful claim, but um, Patanjali will say that there is, uh, there is a method to this. And in fact, all the commentators from Shankara, all these great Vyasa, great commentators, they don't... Um, um, so they don't talk too much about this for a reason. There's a reason why that is, and Patanjali explains that too. And they give just a little bit of information on all extra information, but um, none of them say that it is, uh, these Siddhis are just um, hyperboles or um, metaphors or similes, but they all acknowledge it as being true. Okay, this is the beautiful analogy that Patanjali gives for uh, understanding the Siddhis. Um, so when the mind is not one-pointed, it tends to wander, right? And um, by tracing the sequence, you can go to the starting sequence. So let me uh, show this, uh, this example. You see this person, he's about to go on vacation. He's sitting at work and he is daydreaming. So at three o'clock, his mind is on three o'clock in the morning. He is thinking about three o'clock so he can leave work, catch a flight, go to Hawaii, swim in the ocean. So he's thinking about all this. And suddenly in his mind, there comes the image of a great white shark. So he's rudely woken up from his daydream. And he's thinking, ah, but he's shaking. How did I get here? And then he is able to recollect, oh, I was uh, thinking I'll be in the water swimming and then the flight, three o'clock. So he's able to recount all the way back to the starting sequence. So Patanjali says in a similar way, we can understand the past, um, even though we have no knowledge by, um, so in one of the first of the Siddhis is on this understanding the past and the future. So this is the sutra. Okay. 
Okay, so here Patanjali says, Etena, in this way, using this analogy, Bhuta Indriya issue. So of um, the objects and the sensors, the, the transformation of the innate nature, the feature, and the condition can be explained. So the three important words here to note, which come again and again, and all the commentators of Vyasa has given the, the biggest commentary of any sutra is on this from Vyasa. And Shankara has also commented extensively on this um, sutra. Dharma, these are the three terms here. Dharma, Lakshana, Avastha. Dharma is the innate nature, the characteristics. But this can change with time too. Then Lakshana is a feature. So typically in usage, they would say, oh, this person's Lakshana is very nice, which means he has very nice features, or she has very nice features. And then Avastha, Avastha means condition, new, old. So by tracing all these, you can kind of know the past of a person or object or something. Um, some people have this um, in, intuitive sense, like um, Swami Rama, this thing is talked about quite a bit. He was trying to find a place for his uh, um, ashram. And he walked into different places. And he walked into one place. Uh, this uh, land was available for sale. Immediately he said, no, this won't work. I, I sense a lot of suffering. So they did some, it was very cheap. They did some research and they found out that many years ago, there was a mink farm there. So where they killed mink for the, the skin, the coats. So there's a lot of cruelty. So people with a lot of these siddhis, they're able to um, trace things this way. It's kind of very intuitive for them, but there's a method to how it happens. So the transformation by going, understanding the transformation of the nature, feature, and the condition of objects, you can understand uh, the past and different um, um, aspects. The one important thing that Patanjali says is that even though the dharma, uh, uh, lakshana, and avastha, the features, the, the characteristics, and the status of an object, they change, the dharmi, the substratum, is fixed. So when you're kind of your mind is tracing in meditation slowly about how certain things happened, it's important to main, understand that the dharmi is constant. So that is like your pole star for this navigation. Shanto dita vyapadeshya dharmanupati dharmi. So Patanjali says, Shantaha, which is the past, Udita, which is racing, Av Apadesha, he uses this word for the future, that which cannot be explained. He calls it the future. Avyapadesha. Dharma Anupati Dharmi. So the Dharmi is fixed. It, it just follows the underlying substratum. So for a certain person, if he has certain tendencies like a, a warrior, you would know that um, he has an innate nature to protect um, the weak and oppose the, um, the people who are wicked. So it's, so you would know this is, is, there's a certain dharmi to there and you can trace with along this. So that's how um, Patanjali explains. And there's one more sutra he uses to stress this point again. Kramanyatvam. So the krama is the sequence, um, anya from the explanation um, and the transformation of this explanation. It is the change in this the the sequence of the, for the dharma, the avastha, and the lakshana, and it's not the change in the dharmi, the substratum. So he says all this in the first chapter also, Patanjali talks about a lot of these powers of a one-pointed mind. And one of these sutras is from the first chapter. Sukshma vishayatvam 
ಪಾಂಚಾಲಿಂಗ ಪರ್ಯವಸಾನ ಸೊ ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಸೇಸ್ ದಟ್ ಸೂಕ್ಷ್ಮ ಇಸ್ ಸಟಲ್ ಸೂಕ್ಷ್ಮ ವಿಷಯತ್ವ ವಿಚ್ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ದ ಸಟಲೆಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಆಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ದ ಯೋಗಿ ಇಸ್ ಏಬಲ್ ಟು ಸಿ ವಿತ್ ಅ ಒನ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟೆಡ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಸೊ ದ ಪವರ್ ಆಫ್ ಅ ಒನ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟೆಡ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ದ ಯೋಗಿ ಇಸ್ ಏಬಲ್ ಟು ಸಿ ಆಲ್ ದ ವೇ ಟು ದ ಸಟಲೆಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಆಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಸೋ ಒನ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟೆಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ನೋ ಸ್ಕ್ಯಾಟರಿಂಗ್ ಇಸ್ ಏಬಲ್ ಟು ಸಿ ಸಿ ಲುಕ್ ಸ್ಮಾಲರ್ 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 ಅಂಟಿಲ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಗೋಸ್ ಟು ದ ಸ್ಮಾಲೆಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಆಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ he says even those that have no visible marks or characteristics a linga means those without any visible characteristics um because our mind is used to seeing things that are you know sensational and big and visible but even the subtlest atom which um, doesn't have any characteristics your your mind can see when it's one pointed this is uh, the power of a one pointed mind that patanjali talks about now um i wanted to just play this um video even though it's 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 a little bit uh, of um kind of uh, exhibition and sensations but it's a good um metaphor okay so this scene is from the movie the matrix um most many of you would have seen this movie so this is an analogy for what happens when the mind becomes calm and discerning in meditation it looks as though things happen in slow motion and um a lot of people who um attend these meditation retreats their mind becomes very slow and discerning slow means not slug, uh, sluggish but it's able to see things as though it's in slow motion and this is um the power of a settled mind when you do this even even though things are happening so chaotically you can focus on one and you're able to see it's in high definition and high fidelity in this um book by robert wright um he was actually consulted for the screenplay of this film um he is a meditation teacher so he wrote this book he goes into details about what happens in these meditation retreats when your mind becomes very calm oops okay so patanjali talks about all the siddhis right but he has a word of caution um for the siddhis so he says tata pratibha shravana vedana adarshi get all these great things but tata pratibha shravana vedana adarsha swada varta jayante so from the regular practice of yoga you get pratibha which is spontaneous divine intuition shravana clear audience vedana refined sense of the mind adarsha extraordinary sight clairvoyance aswada swad is taste aswada is great taste vartha smell all these are born but there is a catch te samadha upasarga vyuthane siddhayaha these siddhis can become the obstacles to samadhi the very thing that you want to get to get liberation and they if you're not careful they can bound you because in in this vyuttana means outgoing world of um, worldly pursuits these are um uh, they are obstacles vyuttane siddhaya these in this um, outgoing world they are kind of thought of as great powers but they are indeed samadha upasarga they are obstacles to samadhi this is patanjali's great word of caution on the siddhis it is for that reason that all the commentators they don't stir up by talking in great detail about all these aspects of siddhis they just have a few 
um, uh, verses of explanation, but they don't create more sensationalism on the cities. Now we'll jump to the first city. The 20% of the Yoga Sutras is on the discussion of the Siddhis. So we'll cover the Siddhis now. Parinamatraya samyamad This is the Siddhi of the past and the future. Parinama, the transformation um, of this Traya. The Traya is what we saw. The, uh, the characteristic, the dharma, the lakshana, which is the feature, and the avastha, the state, new, old. By doing samyama on these three, atita, anagatanya, past, and the future knowledge is obtained. This is, and this we kind of can see, right? Because you slowly, um, you are meditate on something you see how this could have moved given that the substratum is fixed and then you can know the past and you also can know the future of what the trajectory of this person or an object is. Then the siddhi of understanding the speech of all creatures. Shabdartha pratyayana mitare taradhyasat sankaras tat pravibhaga samyamat sarva bhutaratagnanam. Okay, so long sutra, but this is how it, it is broken up. Shabda is sound, artha, shabda, artha, then pratyaya. Pratyaya, like we saw, is the screen of the mind where you're playing these ideas, right, with sounds and uh, images. So the Shabda, Artha, and the Pratyaya, they are garbled together. Itare, Tara, Adhyasa. So um, Itare, Tara is one with the other. Adhyasa is imposed. So they're all, and what it causes, it causes Samkara. Samkara is confusion. So because of this garbling, you can't understand. But when you do samyama on their distinction, pravibhaga, their distinction, tat pravibhaga, bhuta, ruta, jnanam. Bhuta is uh, anim uh, beings, their uh, ruta is their speech, is understood. So this is how Patanjali explains how we can understand the speech of all creatures by um, through samyama on them. And then Patanjali talks about the knowledge of previous lives. This is so common. Buddha talks about it. Every um, great saint has talked about the knowledge of the previous lives. Samskara sakshat karanat purva jati jnanam. So we talked about the samskaras, right? They are the imprints. Any thought or an action leaves an imprint on the uh, purusha. By um, understanding all these imprints, the knowledge of the previous lives arises. This is what Patanjali says. For that, you need a very settled and focused mind. Then Patanjali talks about the Siddhi of reading others' mind. So, um, there are different interpretations. Um, pratyaya is the screen of the mind, right? So when you meditate with a screen of the mind, uh, or your screen of the mind, then the knowledge of others' mind arises. This is one interpretation. A few commentators have interpreted it as you, the yogi is so great that he can meditate on the pratyaya, that is a screen of somebody else's mind. Um, then the knowledge of their mind will arise. But the most common thing is when you meditate on the, your screen of your mind, the knowledge of others' mind arises. The one reasoning um, some of the commentators give is we are all some kind of connected. You can know people's tendencies and everything, and you can hone in to a very high degree and read others' minds through um, very deep meditation. Patanjali also, uh, it's, it's, the sutras are very scientifically written, so he also gives some exclusion criteria. Tasya 
So for example, you can read fear in somebody's mind, but you wouldn't be able to know what caused that fear, the alam um, which is the support, which is the, the reason why the fear came, you, you cannot know. Um, that's what Patanjali says. Then comes the Siddhi of Invisibility. Kaya Rupa Samyama Tadgrahya Shakti Stambhe Chakshu Prakasha Samprayoge Tadhanam This is also a long sutra. Kaya is the body. Kaya Rupa is form. By doing meditation on the form of the body, Tadgrahya, that perception that perception the you can the power shakti is power the power of that perception stamba which you can just restrain you can restrain the power of that perception by blocking the light chakshu prakasha asam prayoga just uh, the chakshu is vision prakasha is a light so you by blocking the light from the eyes of the observer, the invisibility is attained. So uh, Patanjali um, seems to, Patanjali says that it's like very scientific. This is how you go about by um, meditation, by blocking the perception, uh, power of perception, by blocking the light from the eyes of the observer, invisibility is attained. And Patanjali also says, you can do um, disappearance of other sensory signals like sound by the same method. So, so pakramam nirupakraman cha karma tat sanyamada param tat jnana marishte bhyomava. So this is actually the next sutra. I think I interspose, but here etena shabda. Antardhanam uktam. Antardhanam is disappearance. Um, it's etene is like etc. In the same way, the disappearance of sound, etc., are also spoken of. So, this is the one for which we heard the sutra. This is the knowledge of the time of death. So, when your meditation, your, um, your mind is very settled you can get all this uh, knowledge of the portents of which indicate your time of death. This is a very interesting sutra and this is extensively talked about in, um, by many people, people who, um, who meditate and who kind of have some kind of like a deep spiritual um, intent, they, they're able to know their time of death. So, so pakraman, so sa is with, Upa is near, Krama is succession. So the karma whose merits are near fruition by meditating on your own uh, stack of personal karma, those that are near fruition and near upakramam, not near succession or completion, the karma whose merits aren't near fusion, fruition by doing meditation on both these as all the stack of personal karma, or through the portents of death. Arishte um, bhyo va. So um, then aparanta jnanam. So you can get the knowledge of your time of death by doing meditation on the stack of personal karma or through understanding the portents of death. And the commentators give a little bit of elaboration on the portents of death. This is very interesting. So when you block your um, um, ears, you would hear a certain sound. Um, scientifically, they explain it as this noise. There are these hairs, which um, kind of it's moving. So this comes. It's not very well understood where this sound, you get a mm, kind of sound. Um, in general, it's thought to be your prana, the fire that's uh, burning in your body. This is how yogic system explains it. And when you don't hear any sound, it means you're approaching death. And when you close your eyes, there's still some light. Um, if you completely close your eyes, there's some light. And you don't see any light, it means you're approaching death. 
and there's other portents. So if you see your ancestor suddenly, um, um, it, it means you're approaching death. And certain animals, um, they will give a sign, like crows. They will give a sign. It means you're approaching death. And then portents of divine beings. If you see them, then you know you're approaching death. So these are um, the different portents that the commentators talk about. Um, so that brings us to the conclusion of the first part. So we've covered meditation and a few of the siddhis. We'll cover the rest of the siddhis in the second part, because Patanjali has allocated quite a bit of a uh, number of sutras for the various siddhis.